A few years ago, I made a video, it was actually my first video ever, which was about basic winemaking equipment for beginners. So if you wanted to get into winemaking, what did you need to buy? What were kind of the minimum requirements to get into the hobby? And now let's say you've been making wine for a while and you want to step up your game. Maybe you think your equipment might be holding you back a little bit. Well, today we're going to talk about some advanced home winemaking equipment to help you out. There's really an endless amount of equipment out there, but today I'm going to go through some of the things that I use pretty frequently and that I think really help me out to make better quality wine or just make my job a little bit easier as a winemaker. And to kind of organize it, I'm going to go from kind of start to finish in terms of the wine making process. One thing that can be pretty helpful is a refractometer. So you probably already have a hydrometer to get an idea of how much sugar is in those grapes or in that fruit juice or whatever you're starting your wine with. But if you're out in a vineyard and you want to get an idea if those grapes are ready to pick or not, you don't really want to have to squeeze enough juice to fill at a little vial to put a hydrometer in. So there's a cool little tool called a refractometer. And what you do to use this is just put a little single or a couple drops of juice on this little plate, look in here, hold it up to a light, and you can see how much sugar is in that juice. This one is, um, it goes up to about 32 degrees bricks. So that's as high as you would ever get for any wine. And I really like this for just walking around in the vineyard, getting a ballpark of what I've got going on. Normally I'll crush up a couple dozen berries to get a good representation of that little row of vines before I go ahead and make my picking decisions. Next, at some point in your winemaking career, you might find that you want to start making wine from whole wine grapes, which I definitely recommend if you want to make a good high quality red wine. It's just hard to replicate that skin and seed time from a wine fermented on the skins when you're trying to do it from some flash extracted juice. But if you get to the point where you want to do this, it is really, really tedious to crush and destem tons of grapes by hand. I've showed you in the past how to do this with a milk crate, but once you get to the point where you're doing anything more than one or 200 pounds of grapes at a time, you really probably want to get something called a crusher destemmer. Now, a crusher destemmer is a pretty simple piece of equipment. Most of these are hand cranked, some of them are motorized, but it cranks it through two wheels that pop the berries and you can adjust the width or the spacing of these wheels. So that sends the whole clusters through, pops the berries, and then from there, there's an auger that pushes these um, clusters that have the pop berries on them across a grate with holes in it. And this allows all those berries to fall through the grate, pushes the stems out of the other side. And it makes really, really quick work of crushing and destemming. You can do in an hour what might have previously taken eight hours to do. So it's, it's not a cheap thing. Um, most of these probably cost anywhere from 400 to $800 if you're in the home winemaking size stuff. I mean, if you have a winery, you're talking way, way more because you're much bigger scale equipment. So it might be something that you want to split if you've got a winemaking buddy because it's one of those things you really only use it a couple days a year, but holy cow, is it a great tool to have. Next on the list is going to be some different options for your primary fermenter. So you might have outgrown little buckets. I actually still will often ferment small batches in buckets, but I also find that a lot of times I have batches that would require a lot of buckets, which is a lot more work if you've got, you know, 25, 40, 50 gallons of wine. Now you've got to sp spread that out between five or 10 buckets. That's just kind of unnecessary. So if you kind of outgrow buckets, the next step up is going to be your food grade garbage cans or brute garbage cans. These are the white ones and these usually come in 20 or 25 gallons. These work really nice for a red wine. 
can do an open top fermentation and do your punch downs. You can also use these 55 gallon plastic food grade drums. A lot of places that deal with fruit juices will have these. You might be able to get them for free or you can get them for really cheap. Um, sometimes they have a removable top, sometimes you have to cut the top off of them. And those again, work really nice for much larger batches of wine. If you've graduated into winemaking from grapes, you'll find that you need something to do your punch downs or submerge your cap. And traditionally what that's gonna be is a punch down tool. Now for a larger winery, you're probably gonna use a punch down tool with a 10 or 12 inch diameter end on it, which sometimes for your really large batches at home, this is a good size. But if you're doing small batches in buckets, which no matter how big of scale you get to, you still probably will do a little bit of that. Um, I like to use this little punch down tool. This is the punch buddy. I found this just not to really be available out there. So I had it made myself. So you can get this on my website, smartwinemaking.com. Um, it's just a really cool tool. If, if you are gonna do larger batches too, you may wanna consider one of those bigger punch down tools, but Personally, I'd say this gets most of my needs done for, for that. As you get more advanced in your winemaking, you'll find that you want to really, really keep track of your fermentation dynamics. So what temperature profile are you fermenting at? That's gonna really change the outcome of that wine, especially if you're fermenting on the skins like a red wine, or for that matter, if you're making a white, white wine and you're trying to ferment it nice and cool to retain a lot of those fruity aromas. Uh, something that you can do to better track that, that temperature profile is get a data logger. So this you can submerge into the wine and upload to your phone periodically via Bluetooth and you can get a really nice temperature profile. You can see if that wine is overheating, you can see what's happening and if you want to make any decisions and you can also take a screenshot of this for your wine journal or your wine log so you can look back at it and kind of see how how things were done on that wine when you know two years later you're drinking it and you forgot completely how you fermented it. After fermentation is complete if you're making a wine from whole fruits or from whole grapes you're going to need a wine press. So for a home winemaker, usually a wooden basket press is gonna be a good option for this. Something around, you know, four to eight gallons, depending on how big of batches you're doing. You can even step up to a stainless steel bladder press if you're really gonna be doing really large batches of wine. And the price you're gonna see for these things, um, sometimes you can find a used pretty nice wine press for about you know, $150, somewhere in that range. Unfortunately, most used ones I see have just been completely trashed. Like they've been left outside, they've been left in someone's garage, they've been varnished, who even knows? So it's kind of hard to find a good used one. Um, if you step up into the stainless steel bladder presses, you're looking usually at about $1,000, even a little bit more than that. I definitely would not recommend that if you're just getting started into wine from grapes, I'd recommend just getting a little basket press. And if you do ever outgrow it, just sell it and then step up to something larger like a bladder press. After pressing, you're gonna move on to aging. And I will still, almost always, I'll still age in glass, carboys. I do so much experimentation that I end up with, at the biggest, my batches might be um, 30 maybe 40 gallons, but still a lot of these batches might only be, you know, 10 or 12 gallons. And that's still very manageable with carboys. Um, they're just a nice shape. They've got a neck that gets really small, which is really nice for preventing oxidation because you've got so little headspace. But um, if you want, you can step up into oak barrels. There are some advantages to aging in oak barrels, but there's also some disadvantages. Um, one advantage is gonna be micro oxidation, which I actually think is a little bit of an overstated advantage. A lot of studies have suggested that most of the micro oxidation that's happening is coming through the bung anyways, which 
you're still gonna get in a carboy. So maybe don't choose a barrel for that reason. But another thing that I actually do think is a pretty big advantage of a barrel is gonna be this concentration effect that happens. So the wine will gradually evaporate through the pores of that oak. You'll find that over time you have to keep topping up that wine to maintain the level in the barrel. And that just kind of allows that red wine to get a little bit more concentrated. Now you can also sort of replicate that without a barrel again, so maybe I'm not selling you on a barrel, but something you can do is called a saunier, where before you ferment that red wine, where you've got all this juice and all these skins, you can pull some of that juice off so you've got a better skin to juice ratio. And that juice that you've pulled off, you can use to make a rosé wine. So maybe I'm not selling you on wine barrels. You can replicate the oak by things like oak cubes, oak staves. There's all sort of all oak alternative products out there that you can use. Now, there are some people, especially if you're making wine with a group of friends, you're getting into really large batches where carboys are just gonna be just too small for what you're doing. But then maybe you don't wanna deal with the hassles of oak barrels. So for things like that, you can jump into stainless steel tanks. On the home winemaking end, you're probably gonna use variable volume tanks. These are tanks that have a stainless steel lid with an inflating um, seal around the inside of that. Now, there's some advantages again and some disadvantages to that. The thing you have to really watch with those is that that seal stays inflated all the time. It never gets deflated. You don't stop looking at it for six months and come back only to realize that your seal lost air pressure and now your wine's completely oxidized. You also wanna make sure that they're using really good stainless steel. If they're not using high grade stainless steel with really low sulfur content, that acidity in the wine will pull out sulfur from the stainless steel. Like certain grades like 303, which can technically be food grade, has a high sulfur content. So you definitely wanna make sure that it's all 304 or even if you wanna go even one level better, 316 stainless steel and made from a reputable company that supplies to the wine industry specifically. Something that's handy to have around is also gonna be an inert gas tank. So you can fill a normal inert tank with nitrogen, argon, or helium. Helium's really gonna be pretty useless because it's really expensive and it's lighter than air, so it's not very good for blanketing a wine with. Nitrogen is gonna be really cheap, but it is pretty neutrally buoyant in air, so it's not the most effective if you have like an open top and you're trying to provide an inert layer, but it's still not bad. The best is gonna probably be argon or early in the winemaking process when you're not too worried about dissolved CO2, you might even want it a little bit. Um, carbon dioxide is also gonna be really good, uh, but you're gonna need a different tank for that. So a CO2 tank has a different fitting than your typical inert gas tank. So something to think about. If, if you thought you might wanna get into sparkling wines later on and you only wanted to have one tank, I'd probably recommend going for the CO2 tank. Another thing you might want to frequently do, I mentioned you might wanna monitor your temperatures of your wine. Well, you might also wanna control those temperatures. So you might wanna bump them up, bump them down. There's a few reasons you might wanna do this. Um, like I said earlier, fermentation profile, but also later on you might wanna do things like cold stabilize the wine where you're intentionally chilling it to drop out potassium by tartrate. So there's a few ways to control the temperature. The later on way you might frequently do if you're dropping out tartrates is gonna be just a spare refrigerator. So is that a winemaking tool? Maybe not, but it is something you might wanna have in your little winemaking area if you really get deep into the hobby. Now, early on, I'll do some different stuff. I'll use things like um, on a small batch, I'll use a seed heater. You can often get these little seed heater mats that come with a thermostat. So you can set the thermostat and put a little probe in there and it'll kick on as necessary to turn up the temperature on that wine. Now that doesn't allow you to turn down the temperature. So for that, 
I will often use things like um, frozen water jugs to chill the wine back down, or you can even use something like a wart chiller. Now, I'm not gonna pump the wine through the wart chiller, but you can pump ice water through a wart chiller. If you wanna do the wart chiller route though, you're gonna wanna make sure to get a stainless steel wart chiller because a copper wart chiller, when in the presence of high acid wine, is gonna break down into copper sulfate, which is something you don't really want in uncontrolled amounts in your wine. It's actually poisonous. So you wanna be careful with copper and wine. Next, you might wanna eventually set up a small little lab table to do some wine testing. So some things you might want in your little wine lab would be a good pH meter. And by the way, I'll put a link in the description of this video to everything that I mentioned here. So if you wanna buy it, you can go ahead and buy it. Um, additionally, in your lab, you're gonna want some lab wear. So I'll use um, graduated cylinders sometimes to measure out additions or measure out certain amounts of wine if I wanna do blending trials. I also often use little 10 milliliter syringes. So those are good, again, for doing little blending trials if you wanna see what it looks like to have 75% of one wine, 25% of another wine, and taste it. Um, other stuff in your lab, you, you're probably gonna want a um, SO2, sulfur dioxide test kit eventually. Um, I use the Vinometrica kit. It's just really, really fast. It costs a little bit of money up front, but after that, the test costs about a dollar each. So it's, in the long run, it's probably cheap insurance because if you lose a batch of wine due to you know, inadequate protection, it's gonna probably cost about what that test kit costs you. You're probably gonna want to have some sort of magnetic stir plate. Um, this can be helpful for doing things like SO2 tests, but it can also be helpful for pre-mixing things like tannin additions or acid additions, sulfite additions to those wines, and it makes you feel cool like you're in a real little winery lab. You may also want some um, chemicals necessary to do uh, titratable acidity tests in your little lab. And beyond that, I mean, you can have things like a microscope. You probably want a 1000X lens on it and with that, you can actually see the little yeast and the microbes in there. Whether it really <laughs> changes your winemaking decisions, it probably won't. So you probably don't really need it, but it might be something you want if you're just gonna really, really get deep into it. You might even be able to identify some spoilage, bacteria, or yeast with that. Eventually, you may find that you wanna dabble in carbonating a wine. Um, if you get into this, the way you're probably gonna do it is well, you could do it with natural bottle fermentation, but that's also, it's a little bit difficult. It's a little bit hard to be repeatable and it can also be a little bit dangerous, but the, the more common way to do it is gonna be with forced carbonating. And for that, you're gonna use Cornelius kegs or corny kegs. I'd recommend probably getting ball lock. Um, you can get ball lock or pin lock, but it seems like anymore everybody's gravitating to ball lock so you might spend a few extra dollars for the keg, but now you're gonna be able to find every accessory possible for that because most of them are ball lock. Uh, for that, you're also gonna need a CO2 tank, a CO2 regulator. If you want to serve that wine on tap, you're gonna need a faucet. You may um, even want a variable flow rate faucet. I really like inter-tap. I've had some kind of bad experiences with Perlic because again, um, I don't think they're using the highest grade stainless steel for a couple of those components, which seem to be leaching sulfur when you run a high acid wine through it. And the last thing you want is your wine on tap to smell like sulfur. If you do use a variable flow rate faucet, though, there's no way to have a spring return on it. So if you have a kid or somebody around, somebody bumps the handle, you could actually drain that whole thing on the floor. So something I have made, and again, you can find this on my website, Smart Winemaking, is an automatic spring return adapter that fits basically any keg faucet or any of your, you know, 
most common keg spouser faucets. If you want to bottle that wine that has now been carbonated, well, that's also pretty tricky to do because you try to pour it in a bottle and it just overflows with CO2 or with foam. And the probably the best thing to do at home is to use something called a counter pressure bottle filler. So these little things will allow you to pre-pressurize that bottle before you pour that wine in it. And it, rather than it releasing at atmospheric pressure, it's now going into something that's relatively almost equal pressure to the vessel that it came out of. So you get minimal foaming and it makes it something you can actually pull off. Sometimes you wanna do the exact opposite, which is to remove carbon dioxide from wine. And to do this, you're gonna want a degasser. Um, I like to use this little chain style stainless degasser, the little ones with the plastic paddles are, um, generally those paddles will break off over time. They're just not that reliable. And honestly, with anything winemaking, I like to do a buy it once method versus buying this stuff that ends up breaking and not lasting me forever. Cause the last thing you want is when you really need that thing for it to be broken on you. Uh, some things I didn't mention. Another advantage to having your inert gas tank is that you can now do wine transfers with this by using um, one of these little orange caps. So if you put one of these little orange cap doohickeys on your racking cane, you can just apply, put this in the carboy, kind of loosely seal this on the top and just apply a tiny bit of pressure to this second little tubey thing coming out of here and start your racking cane, which is probably the easiest way to start a racking cane. I know I've made some videos on how to start a racking cane about five different ways. Well, if you got an inert gas tank, the easiest one is gonna be that. I actually put a little adapter on my, my ball lock fitting here. So this is actually for carbonating in soda bottles, which again, in it, it in itself is a cool thing to have. But what it allows you to do is rather than trying to disconnect this or something every time you wanted to use your inert gas for blanketing versus kegging. Um, it allows you to just click this on here and now you can get some flow right out of the end there. I mentioned kegging carbonated wines or sparkling wines. Well, you can also keg a still wine, which I'll occasionally do. You may wanna use a smaller keg. I really like these 2.5 gallon torpedo kegs for that. I found that um, you can use argon to propel it. You can use nitrogen to propel it, but wine generally likes to have just a minuscule amount of dissolved CO2. So even though those still red wines that you drink, they have no really perceivable CO2 well, if you take away completely all the CO2, it can start to taste a little bit woody or harsh. So you actually want this minuscule bit of dissolved CO2. So you can use something like beer gas to propel it, which is 25% CO2, 75% nitrogen. That, to do that though, you're, you're gonna wanna make sure to keep the pressure really, really low in that keg. So you might keep it at like really just enough pressure to serve something like, um, I don't know, maybe three or four PSI. Or what I'll often do is I'll have a keg of nitrogen, but I also have a keg of CO2. So I'll just give it a little like second hit of CO2, but then the rest of it will be nitrogen. And that seems to maintain enough dissolved CO2 to keep that wine nice and I would say lively and also it seems to help it last just a little bit longer in the keg. You can get that keg to now last months and months and months versus after a couple months starting to get a little bit maybe dull on you. I hope that helped you out. If there's any winemaking equipment that I may have missed, make sure to mention in the comments. And I didn't really repeat anything from that first video, so you should probably 
If you want to know the complete list of wine things, probably watch these two videos together. The beginner winemaking equipment and the advanced winemaking equipment. Maybe someday we'll go to a, even another level and do professional wine making equipment. If you want to help support the home winemaking channel and keep videos like this coming, make sure to swing by my Patreon site, patreon.com slash makewine. Thanks for watching.